So now I have the pleasure of actually introducing Dr. Erica Brown. Dr. Erica Brown is an associate professor at George Washington University's Graduate School of Education and Human Development and is the director of its Maybrook Center for Jewish Education and Leadership. She also consults for nonprofits and served as scholar for the Jewish Center in Manhattan and the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington, where she directed its Jewish Leadership Institute. Erica was a Jerusalem Fellow, is a faculty member of the Wexner Foundation, the Abbey High Foundation Fellow, and a winner of many awards and honors. Erica has degrees from Yeshiva University, University of London, Harvard University, Baltimore Hebrew University, and is the author of 11 books and countless articles. Last but not least, Erica is a treasured friend and a beloved teacher to many of us here at Metro West. We've had the opportunity to hear her speak many times, and I'm thrilled to be able to hear her speak again because she, you're, you're in for a treat. We are grateful that she's back today to teach us and help us with succession planning and share her insights into Jewish leadership and board development. So without any further ado, we'd like to welcome Dr. Erica Brown. Larry, thank you. Um, Sarah, thank you for having me. Um, um, it's wonderful to see many of my old friends here, uh, people I've learned with for many years, uh, and happy to keep up with. So thank you for having me back in these halls. Uh, it's a little gray outside. It's a little gray inside. So we got some work to do today uh, to you know to shift things around. I do want to make a correction because that was an old bio. Um, I actually currently serve as the community educator for Eight Time, which is a synagogue in Livingston, New Jersey. Uh, and I say that because um, it's my own commitment to this area and m much of the friendship that I have been uh, fortunate to feel. Many of you know uh, many of uh, the people I've studied with, uh, you know, made this an easy yes. Uh, and um, Rabbi Sam Klibanoff has been really wonderful about um, making sure that it's time as a contributing member to the Federation at large and support Federation activities. So he was very happy for me to take uh, some time off from synagogue work there to come here. So what I want to do is ask you. You have a sheet in front of you with the handout. We're going to get there. You all have a pen? Yes? If you don't have a pen, just raise your hand and let me know right now. Okay, so we need one pen. Two. Anyone else? You need a pen? It's okay. You don't have to feel like pen shame. All right? There's no pen shaming here. Sunday morning. It's early. We're getting ourselves together. Um, so Sarah's kindly giving out some pens. I think we need one right here. Um, so what I want you to write down for me is just one sentence, your your current leadership challenge. It's like, and it could start this way, my current leadership challenge is, and I don't want you to say, I'm in a synagogue that's dysfunctional. That is not your leadership challenge, all right? You may be challenged, you say, my challenge is that I'm trying to help my synagogue, but I want you to be as specific as possible, okay? So, and you don't necessarily have to share this with me, although you may choose to share. My current leadership challenge is, speak up, but of course I'd love if some of you did. Leadership challenge right now. Yes, please. The and you are wrong. Can't find a president to succeed in my organization. You can't find a president to succeed you. Do you see that as your problem? Well, certainly uh, I'll be that forever as president. <laughs> <laughs> so it is your problem, right? I don't know if anyone wants to help Ron out. But, uh, you know, Ron is, is putting a bid out there. He's, he's saying something. So, uh, so Ron needs to find someone to replace him. Um, anyone else had another succession challenge? Yeah. Mine's at the opposite end of the spectrum, that it's hard to find um, young leaders that are going to be able to lead the organization. Um, and I think that's 
begin the process of getting more involved in Example, like, honest, so frame like, this, Marjorie, in, in terms of your challenge. I am. I my, feel like I, I'm asking people regularly, "Hey, would you like to do this?" And they're like, "Sounds great, but I'm really busy." Yeah. And so we have to talk about that a little bit because it's very common. Yeah. It's beyond Metro West. I don't know how often you get out, I'm just telling you that uh, it happens. Stuck. Hey, you're stuck. You're stuck. Uh, but you know, bringing people who are into it, you know, who are going to chart their own leadership course, and how do you do that effectively? We're not going to resolve all issues, but I want to just surface some of the issues. Uh, you raised your hand and wait. Yeah, they want... basically was having. I have to get more people who aren't involved involved. Yeah. And by the way, we're going to talk about the fact that for many of us, this issue of recruitment is true for virtually every organization that I know. Uh, certainly organizations that are older and legacy organizations are struggling a lot with this. Um, and what's interesting is our, our tuition rates, our membership rates keep going up. And that doesn't help us uh, recruit new people. Sometimes we're in areas which are very expensive. So getting new and younger people in is hard, just really the economics of it aren't working. And sometimes we actually don't realize that we spend a lot of time in boards talking to each other. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about a board technique that I think is really important. It's a shift of a board role to help uh, recruit and maintain, retain people. That's, because that's critical. You certainly don't wanna lose the people you already have. And that's happening. It's actually happening in federations across the country. Um, you know, never mind the fact that campaign raising money for campaigns is hard. It's that the donor base has gone down really significantly in virtually every federation around the country. And that actually was a decision. It was a strategy. Here's the strategy. I don't know. I can't date the strategy, but let's say it was it was 50 to 20 years ago. We're not gonna, you know, the $18 gifts aren't significant for us. We don't, you know, we're gonna go after the big dollars, the big plaques, right? We're, that's what we're gonna go after, not realizing that a casualty of that strategy is that a lot of donors who were giving 18, even a $1,000 felt, I'm not getting love here. I'm not feeling, you know, part of a community. So we were talking the community language, but really we didn't mean it. What we meant is, the community of the wealthy. And that is, I want you to think about how that is applying in your own organization, because the Federation is not the only one who used this as a strategy. When I'm talking about Federation, I've spent 17 years, I'm not currently in the Federation, but I spent 17 years in Boston and DC in Federation work, so I know this work very intimately. Um, someone else had hands up, a literature challenge. Yeah, um, I'm finding it increasingly difficult to find religiously knowledgeable people who work within the context of planning for um, events like Bar Mitzvah, particularly Bar Mitzvah as the younger generation of Jewish, social Jewish Judaism as opposed to religious Judaism. Okay, so interesting, right? So how do you identify people who perhaps have more religious knowledge or Jewish knowledge as opposed to, you know, the purely social <coughs> sort of uh, connections that people have? How do you ramp up the stakes? In terms of Jewish literacy, right? For Bar Bat Mitzvah. Yeah. Well, not even for the Bar Bat Mitzvah, but to find someone to take over the Bar Bat Mitzvah, or I will also go old in that way. Yeah. Well, so I, I'm thinking well, that you and Ron should go out to Starbucks. <laughs> I feel like there's, there's <laughs> what to talk about here. I mean, what what is Ron? Ron. Well, why don't, why don't you ask Ron? <laughs> what shul are you? I'll trade you. You do my Bar Mitzvah for your present. She wants to know what shul you're in, Ron. Well, she wants I to do a switcher. I've sneaked in here. I'm past president of the Mount Free and Food Center, but I'm president of Jesse House, and I'm here to try to work on it. Okay, so you guys can discuss if you want to switch roles. That's fine. Uh, that would be a good outcome of today. Uh, we got some work done here. We got some business done. All right, another leadership challenge. Yeah? Our challenge is the old guard versus the new guard, and neither side understands language or the culture and each one is vying for control which then results in leadership and professional staff being at odds because they're trying to work with both ends of the center. Yeah. The culture it really has changed but the old guard doesn't want to change yeah. the culture. Yeah and John I'm so happy you said that because we know right now across organizations 
the baby boomers are living longer and holding on to positions of leadership longer. Generally, a lot of Jewish organizations, they're focused on millennial outreach. So people like me in Generation X, we're totally invisible in organizational life. Right? No one is really interested in us. Um, they're interested in having people on their boards who represent a younger generation, an older generation. Anyone who's been doing reading, and I'm going to mention a number of different books as we, for those of you who are interested in reading more about this, um, uh, there's an important book, When Generations Collide, about, uh, about multiple generations in the workplace. And I think it's true for volunteer life also. Um, the expectations of what we're supposed to do, uh, the need to kind of jump the queue, right? So if you're in synagogue leadership, if you're in day school leadership, if you're in federation leadership, it takes a long time to be president of an organization. But now you're a young person, you say, like, I, I want to jump start the queue, right? And I, I, I want to go quicker. This, this pace isn't working for me. Um, so you've got those kind of issues. You've got issues of um, the kind of programs that we're running. Right? Are, they, are these meaningful for us? Do we want to come out for these programs or we don't want to come out for these programs? Um, so I'm going to make a comparison which has been enormously helpful in my understanding of Jewish organizational life. And if, if it can be helpful to you, I'm happy. So the, uh, someone said uh, once to me, you know, it used to be that being, I think this is still working. Um, I mean, I don't really need this. Um, okay. Um, so in Jewish organizational life, it used to be that you would uh, go into a community, move into a community, and this may be true for your parents or grandparents, <coughs> that you went into a community and you became, you gave to the donation to the Federation, you joined the JCC, you joined the synagogue, because that's what you do, right? That's what Jews do, right? And we're, you know, we're going to uh, call that a fixed price menu. Okay, we're going to do this in food terms because everyone loves food. Um, fixed price menu. You move into a community and you just do the whole thing. Um, now, what happened over time was the fixed price menu gave way to the a la carte menu, which is fee for service. That was what was happening in the world at large as, as consumers, and it happened to Jewish organizations also. So fixed price menu means we join a synagogue for a bar mitzvah, and maybe we, we're in a day school for a little while because till grade eight, and that works for us, um, you know, or, or a preschool, and then we move in terms of organizational commitments in and out depending on our needs. So we had this really weird thing going on in demographic studies, um, and it wasn't a big, it wasn't a significant, a statistically significant detail. It was just an unusual detail. We had people who were sending their children to day schools who were not members of synagogues. Right? That was kind of weird. But it was actually an expression of this a la carte menu. <coughs> Bernie Marcus, right? uh, one of the founders of, um, of Home Depot, uh, and, a, and a big uh, philanthropist and significant philanthropist in the Jewish community, said the Jewish community is amazing on the consumer level. We lose customers four times. They come to us for a bris, a bris they come for a bar bat mitzvah, they come for a wedding, they come for a funeral. And each time they're coming to us, and each time we're not necessarily getting it right, right? They're leaving. They're not retaining and staying. So that's the fixed price menu moved to the a la carte menu, which is a real challenge. Hello? Is that working? Okay, good. Um, I can hear myself fine. Uh, <laughs> and then someone, and someone gave me this language. Well, you know what we're having today is not an a la carte menu. We're having a tapas menu, which I thought was very clever. Now people want even less of our services. And not only do they want less of what we do, they only want a little bit because they're getting a little bit from multiple organizations. So you have people who are actually going to a synagogue every single Friday night. It just happens to be a different synagogue. Right? Um, where's the best kiddish? This is huge. So I'm just saying, if you're in the synagogue business, think about this. This is real. This is real, um, right? How welcome people feel, right? So they're trying out different things. Now, this is terrible for sustaining membership. It is terrible for paying the bills, right? You know, paying electricity bills. It's terrible for paying salaries. And it's actually pretty wonderful for the consumer. Right? It doesn't necessarily need to show commitment. Now, we have to show that that's not always great for the consumer because you want continuity of, uh, to build community, you need continuity. 
So what does that look like? Now, I'm not going to judge what it is for right now. I just want to put it out there that that is what's happening. And sometimes uh, you'll have older established folks who resist that. And they just say, no, this is the way it should be. And you're saying, buddy, this is the way it is. Social media, someone posted, great kiddish coming up at, mm -hmm. let's go. And the herd goes, right? So you can be angry about it from today till tomorrow, and it doesn't fit into your notion of how a Jewish community functions, but it doesn't matter, because it's the way they were functioning. And we also don't do enough focus groups with younger people, and by the way, Generation X, to find out what's missing for you. What do you really want? So we've got judgments on high. We know what's best for you. That is not the way people do business today. All right? You want to know, what do you want? And by the way, when someone shows up for something that they want, we don't do enough of the Amazon, if you like this, you'll like that. Because that's the key to getting people to stay, is to say, okay, you came in, let's not let go of you. You came in, what else could we, have you thought about this and this? So an email following up from the experience. By the way, here's what the email should not say. Now you've had an experience with us, donate now. Take that donate button, it's on your website, push it when it's in the email, push it aside for a little while. Because, uh, I'm just saying this, anytime I have an experience in Washington DC, I go to the Kennedy Center, <coughs> next day I know I'm gonna get the email, which is donate now. I can't have an experience of anything without also being guilted into giving. So we gotta think about that. How much our first contact or second contact is really about money as opposed to about meaning. And, and in that second email, we're so delighted that you crossed our threshold. Um, you came to this. Here are a few other wonderful things we'd love to see you. These are basic marketing design. I know nothing about marketing. I'm just saying from, from speaking to people. Yeah, you end up, please. yeah, I was just going to say that there are plenty of tapas restaurants that make money. Yeah. Right. So it's you know it's not the same model as a four course fancy yeah. meal um, or a prefix which is right. your, you know, your traditional synagogue or organization. So the question is, you know, how do you adjust your business? Right, so if you, to monetize it, you have to say, how do we charge? Right, so there's plenty of JCCs, they're not giving up the model. They, it's a membership model. But honestly, I called up my YMCA because they were offering a class. I said, you know, this is what the class costs, but you have to be a member, and this is what the membership costs. Just hung up the phone. Right, was that sound, and you say, oh, but, you know, I don't, there's a limit of money that people have, right? I, so I'm not going to pay that much. So in thinking about, again, what are people, what's the price point? What's the interest point? What are we doing to grow people where they are? Without assuming old methods or old ways of thinking about membership and, uh, and, and, and recruitment. All right, one more challenge. Yeah, please. Well, from the perspective, not really of the board, the rabbi, of my challenge is to help the synagogue to be meaningful in the lives of its members, okay. which touches on a lot of the things that you were saying about helping people find meaning something worthwhile, whether it's for one particular event or for yeah. uh, really they stay for, uh, you've shown them that they like X, and maybe they could also like Y and Z. Right. Yeah, being meaningful, being relevant. What's one person's meaning is not another person's meaning in terms of what they're looking for from synagogue life. How many of you here are representing synagogues? Okay. Uh, where are the rest of you? What are, what are you, the rest of you doing? Where are you, what are you representing? If you didn't have your hands up as a synagogue. Yeah, please. Federation of Northern New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. So I find myself thinking, having a 20, almost 25 year old and a 20 year old that they tell me the synagogue model is outdated and no longer valid for how they want to practice the Judaism. Yeah. And I have one living in Pittsburgh, one in Boston, they're both very active in the Jewish communities, but very differently. Yeah, and in fact, we, you know, I, I imagine you have a demographic study of this community. Um, every decade or so, demographic studies are done around the country. And, uh, you know, what's interesting about how or at least some demographic studies are done, is they measure the demographics of a Jewish community by who is a member, a paying member of an organization. Are you a member of a synagogue? Are you a member of a JCC? Do you give a gift to federation? People are not doing Jewish that way. They're just not. So you're not gonna count them. In fact, they may have intensely rich Jewish lives. 
I yeah. have to admit that's a frustration for some young professionals. Yes. So my son's up in Boston. He cannot be put on a board without making a significant donation. It's too early for him to do so. Right. Correct. So, so he's getting turned off versus turned yeah. on. Right. So there's rules that are actually inhibiting real membership and participation. But there are a lot of challenges. There's a lot of challenges. But they're challenges of meaning, and they're challenges that actually force old institutions to come into confrontation very directly with new ways of being in the world. We learned something about from President Obama's campaign. Uh, Microgiving is actually super effective. When you tell someone, we're going to have a micro campaign, it's like, we don't want five dollars. We're starting off with 118, right? That's where, that's our price point, right? It's like, but what we learned was that that first gift is a really important gift and a meaningful gift in terms of creating a tra trajectory of giving. So if you didn't want to create the micro campaign because you were looking for the macro campaign, you're actually not going to get a lot of the people that you were going to get. And a lot of this comes really from studying trends in the general philanthropic world, in the general organizational world, what's going on, as opposed to talking to ourselves. So what I want to do is uh, invite you to your, uh, look at the handout with me. And I, I'm, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you uh, two minutes on the clock to answer these three questions uh, in writing, if you don't mind. Do you find your current board role meaningful? If so, why? If not, why not? If you could run your board, right? And some of you may be running a board, but if you're not running a board, if you could run your board, what are three improvements you'd make right away? On the assumption that we could do things right away. All right, so I'm going to give you two minutes on the clock. seconds left. taking bids for who has the biggest board. Let's go, let's go. Who's got the bigger board than 40? Are we counting, are we counting permanent members as that? Sure, of course. 40? 40 something, anyone bigger? Anyone bigger? Going once, going twice? Uh, I've worked with boards of synagogues that are a hundred and five members. Ah. <laughs> These are big synagogues, but you know what? It's unwieldy. It's 
unwieldy. And so they all show up. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, don't be silly. Um, all right. Okay. So one thing more is changing is size of the board. What else? Come on. Okay, make sure the board members commit to an activity, right? They're chairing something, they're actually, they're active. What else? Okay, so they, they're coming to the temple for more than a board meeting. Jeremy, what do you got for me? So, I would like to change the time committee. What we're always focused on is a monthly meeting, and with everyone being so stretched for time, I'd rather have the committee be meeting, and maybe once a quarter the board is getting together, Sort of flip that, that flip them up. Yeah. Okay, so fair, right? I want to want to switch around the the time commitment for people. What else? What do you have? This is going to feel cold, but no. uh, I want better data, and I want access to the data for the board members. I want them to really understand who is in our congregation because people get very siloed. And Why is that cold? I think it just doesn't sound like. I think it is to the end of building community. Yeah. It just sounds like. Numbers. I want to know. I want. Yeah, but we they can form decisions when we know what the numbers are. Right. Right. Imagine a budget with no numbers. Um, yeah. Foam what? Foam free zone. Foam free zone. I'm, I'm so glad you said that because I've been hearing some notifications. This um, Yeah. Um, I, normally, I say this. Um, I do not let my undergraduates have phones on their desks or use laptops. Uh, we actually have some research that even knowing that a phone is within your visual presence is a distraction. So even if you're not on it, you're also thinking, I may get a better offer any minute now. Uh, so what does it look like for board to say, and by the way, sometimes the biggest mockers are the worst abusers of the phone. Uh, we're not going to talk about late professional relations, although we could have a party. Um, sometimes uh, professionals have their phones on. Um, they're, and part of that has to do with the fact that they're not sufficiently engaged or brought into the conversation. So they're sitting in the back doing their own thing, but that doing their own thing is not helpful, right? So, great, that's a great policy. What else we got for me? Yeah? I would like our board to be able to like, call into the board meetings or have Zoom. Zoom is technology because I can't always get to the meeting or yeah. maybe traveling. <coughs> Yeah, technology is so much better now than it's ever been, right? As long as, by the way, you, you're on mute. Because I just want to tell you, I've done conference calls, and 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 one time there was a flush. And you know what? <laughs> that just shouldn't be happening. It shouldn't be happening. Uh, it's wrong. Uh, yeah? I'd like the board meetings to be more like business meetings, where there's uh, people just don't sit around and report, our committee did this with no discussion, our committee did that with no discussion, and instead, It'd be like a focused agenda or presentation where you know we would learn something about what's going on in the synagogue and we could have some back and forth okay. conversation. All right, so we don't need reports. In fact, probably the worst thing you could say about a board is you missed the meeting and it didn't matter because you could read everything, right? Just send me the reports. If we're not going to have a discussion, some actually, some people believe that all board meetings should be a vote at every board meeting or a significant decision where people have to vote because it gets people to come and it gets people to be engaged, right? Even if it's not, let's say, a, a, a deeply, not deeply meaningful is the wrong term, but significant vote, it's still a vote. It still means that your voice counts and that you're actually deciding something and there's some kind of conversation. All right, what else? Board challenges, yeah? I'd like to have an institutional organization of information so that someone takes on a job person who had it before has written out what works, what didn't work. Okay. So what works and what doesn't work. Um, I'm going to just tweak that a little bit because uh, uh, you may or may not want to learn from your predecessor. Uh, but one thing that has become more popular is, uh, uh, is volunteer job descriptions. Um, I, I think that it's really important. Your volunteer job description basically says this is what's involved, whether it's in this committee, whether it's on this board. You can expect it to take this much time, generally. Um, and also mention um, uh, any kind of rules or protocols around the position, responsibilities and expectations. And so you'd say, oh, that's so hard to do. No, it's not. Writing a paragraph, right? This is what it looks like. Now, it could be that someone experiences the job and says, here, I have some things that I want to share with you that are instrumental in helping this run more efficiently. 
um, here, you know, I do this or I've done that. You know, those are those are pieces of wisdom that you could collect, and that's a nice thing. It didn't work, right? Don't do it again. All right. Debriefing, yeah. See. Okay. Um, so I fully support fewer meetings. Uh, okay. I think it leads to more meaningful meetings and easier commitments and reduces the hurdle. I'm the chairman of a publicly traded hundred million dollar company, and we have four meetings a year. It can be done. If, if you have a show board with a three hundred thousand dollar budget, you don't need monthly meetings. Um, it leads to other things, but the biggest thing I found is helpful is setting the right expectations, which goes back to a good orientation, yeah. and that's where you can level set everything in terms of commitments, requirements, setting the stage for financials. This is where you can, you know, so if you have a really strong orientation, onboarding session. Um, I think you could have board yeah. productive board members. For the yeah, so an onboarding session, which a lot of people get thrown into boards, they have no idea what they're doing. So just look at this quote, just because Steve gave me a good segue um, from the effective board of trustees. That's your middle quote there, nearly on the first page. Nearly all volunteers want to be effective board members, yet most are uncertain how to do so. The vast majority of trustees are not systematically prepared for the role prior to their appointment to a governing board. Nothing in life to that point quite prepares you for this role. Trustees must grow up more upon hammy down she list than upon a, upon a solid body of knowledge about governance and its influence on not for profit organizations, right? So, you know, that means that you you've got you know great people before you and they and they and they and they prepare you well, um, but it's a crapshoot because sometimes you'll have someone who's not good and they're not gonna do that. Um, you'll notice, by the way, that there is a sheet that looks like this in your um, in your one of your pockets. Um, and I'm giving this to you, I'm sure that Sarah would be happy to email it to you. Uh, this is an example of a volunteer board contract. How many of you currently sign a volunteer board contract? Not so many, a handful basically. Um, this is becoming more important and uh, along with volunteer job description. By the way, do any of you, are you any of you organizations where they use a volunteer job description? Okay, so you want two, okay. Um, so here, members of the board of directors at the blank play a vital role. The board is responsible for the fiscal health of uh, They're expected to promote. They're expected to make blank in terms of their commitment. They're expected to engage in fundraising, the best effort events, and all this. What you're having is the, an understanding of what you're supposed to be at and when. Um, now, I didn't, I didn't create this. I just took this off of, um, off of someone else. Um, but. Um, uh, I want to look at one piece of this. Uh, the last one, board members must respect the confidentiality of board discussions and not disclose confidential board matters to others. Now, why do you want to have that in a contract? Which, by the way, this is not legally binding contract. No one's suing, okay? I just want to make that clear. But you're signing it, and the president of your board is signing it, and sometimes the, sometimes the CEO or the rabbi signs it, depending on the kind of or your org chart. Uh, why do you want to have uh, that sort of statement about confidentiality and design. Because you want to set the expectation. You want people to realize, you know, this is what we expect from you, and you know, whatever happens, the board stays with the yeah. rules. And by the way, when you have 40 members, what are you thinking? I can tell this person what happened in the board. Because honestly, I mean, all 40 of us are going to keep quiet, right? That's different than when you have um, an executive committee of five. You know that it, if it's been leaked, one of you's done it. So, um, and I'll say something else about having a board contract and why it's really important. When you have a board contract, if you know that someone has been leaking information or speaking badly or sharing, it's been called a board of trustees for a reason. You are trusted with some critical information, financial and other. So now you're blabbing about it, and uh, the president can sit you down and say, you know, you signed something, and this is real. It was, you, you, you gave, you, you told us that you were willing to commit to this aspect of it. If this is hard for you, then you can't serve on this board. And, um, and I'll tell you something else that uh, just is a practical matter that had a big impact on me. There's a synagogue in our area, a large conservative synagogue in our area, that uh, for a year they really worked a lot as a congregation on not speaking much on Harav. It was a very beautiful thing. Wednesdays was the day, and so like, Wednesday is going to be, you know, like, we're really going to make an effort. We're not going to ask you to do it every day of the week, right? Wednesday. How do I, how do I know it was Wednesday? Because I had meetings with people from that congregation on Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, <laughs> so, 
one thing they did, which was a beautiful practice, and um, they told me that it had really members of the board that told me it really shaped the conversation, was that they studied two laws, or one law, uh, uh, around not speaking, you know, Lashon Hara, not speaking badly about anyone, slanderously about anyone, before they began their meeting. Such a beautiful notice. Instead of having that Tavar Torah where everybody glazes over, you just took something from Wikipedia, okay, and you just read it, and it was so unbeatable, they, they would copy a text, write down the text, everyone would study it together, think about it together, and you could be sure that the conversation was elevated, right? That we weren't having the same old conversation. I gotta tell you, from a fundraising perspective, some of the meanest conversations, and I mean mean, low, mean conversations around what people didn't give. Or did they? This wasn't a meaningful gift because they went on this vacation. And that was like, are you in their bank account? Are you in their lives? Do you know what's going on with them? Was, and then there were people who said, I don't want to be a member of that board because that board is not a functional board. It's not a board of integrity. It's not. It was, you're in a Jewish space. You should be in a high and high moral ground. And the more senior you get in your leadership, it shouldn't be that you're 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 expecting less from the people who are most involved. You should expect more. And you can only expect more if you really raise the stakes in terms of what your board discusses, but not only what they discuss, but also how they discuss it. How they discuss it. Um, so what I want to look with you at um, and invite you to think about any of these techniques that we're talking about now, uh, you know, the job descriptions, the contracts, um, is board responsibilities. This may be patently obvious to people. It's not always patently obvious in, in the world as it works currently. The, what are basic board responsibilities? And there are lots of, you can go to board sources, a lot of different places that discuss this. This was a lovely small book called Welcome to the Board. And it's on page one of your handout. So Fisher Howe identifies seven responsibilities of the board that need to be clear, whether it's Steve's onboarding process, right, you have an onboarding process for the members, or whether you have an annual, you know, at a board retreat, or something annual. Number one, attendance. What is the attendance requirement on your board? Now, if you say our attendance requirement is you have to be at 10 out of 12 meetings, and then someone comes to eight, are there any consequences for that? So that's an interesting question, you know, if there are not consequences for that. Um, two, mission. What is the mission of the organization? Everyone on your board should know the mission of the organization. Where do I find the mission of your synagogue? Where am I finding it? Website, okay. Where else? Constitution. Constitution, yeah. Um, on the back of our name cards for every board meeting is our mission. Gorgeous. Grab that. Yeah. Think about directory. Send out directory. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I actually walked into a public school and I saw the mission of the school right there, right at the entrance. I thought to myself, gee, what does it look like for a synagogue? What is your mission? I've done mission statements with synagogues. And it's really funny, like, I say, look, what's your mission? And they'll go, we're a place to pray. Right? Every synagogue is a place to pray. Right? In the Washington area, there's something like over 90 congregations. What's making yours distinct? By the way, don't tell me you're a warm and welcoming community when no one says Shabbat Shalom. Okay? Just, I, it's just strangers. So I'm done with that. Right? So you're going to need to actually capture what your synagogue is really about. Who it's serving? Is it serving in a niche way? Um, are, you, are you doing outreach in a particular way? Um, and how do you ha can all of your board members actually articulate, without reading off of a piece of paper, what your mission is? You'd be surprised at how many can. Yeah? I learned many years ago the idea of putting the mission statement top of your agenda that went up to the board meeting. Beautiful. And then, by doing that, when people would come to different things that didn't meet the mission, it was easy to say, that's beautiful. Beautiful. Love it. So yeah. Susan's contribution was, uh, to this to this segment of the conversation is can, is your mission not not it, it, table tent knows it, you can you could not put you can you need to put it everywhere you can right um, the, the, your mission statement is on the agenda for the meeting so that if an issue comes up like you're thinking about a program right and you're saying well does this meet with our our mission requirements right so it's right there you don't have to stretch and it's a way that when you keep you know referring to the mission. It enables people to think carefully about who you are and how distinctive you are and how to make the case. All right, so so what Hal says is attendance, mission, chief executive slash leadership. Um, you're responsible as a board 
for making sure that you have the correct leadership in place and the effectiveness of that leadership. That might look at, like a subcommittee who is doing a performance review. Uh, I'm gonna ask you for a show of hands, because some of you may know this, but all of you should know this. Um, does your rabbi have an annual performance review? Okay. Some of you may not know that. Some of you look down. Um, it is not, it is not true that all synagogues uh, have an annual review for the rabbi. So I was once in a leadership class actually in DC, and this issue came up, and uh, oh, our shul has never done an annual review of the rabbi. Why? Because it's not, it's not okay. You know, it's, like, it's not okay to criticize the rabbi. That's just not part of what we do. We don't criticize the rabbi. This is not about criticizing the rabbi. It's giving important, focused feedback to the rabbi. You can't criticize the rabbi. I said, well, what about the contract? There was a contract. Oh, it's a lifetime contract. So I just said, move. <laughs> right? In other words, you're not going to get around this. Um, how is that done? And you could say, oh, our rabbi doesn't need feedback. We give our rabbi feedback every day, right, in the form of anecdotal calls. And it's very hard for people who do this for the, do this work as a real service, as a spiritual service to our communities, to hear the constant barrage. And you don't always know if, if when someone's complaining, it actually represents something you have to think about or represents someone's pet peeve and their problem. So having some kind of understood, and by the way, it's important to be transparent with the community. Our, a, a lot of communities have no idea if their rabbis or their clerk, other members of their clergy are ever routinely, um, you know, are ever routinely given feedback. So it's different to say we have an email dedicated to this. We're currently in the process of our annual performance group. If there are things that we should bring to the rabbi's attention or the clergy, the cantor's attention, um, please let us know. Uh, and with the, with the caveat, please bear in mind that we are human beings, that we are flawed, right? that, um, that, are, that our clergy are doing this for the best possible reasons, right? In other words, to help people just make it softer. There are a lot, there's a lot of meanness in synagogues, in synagogue cultures. And, um, and sometimes that's us. So we have to think a little bit about that. Yeah? So we instituted um, about a year or two ago performance reviews for all of our senior employees, basically. Yeah. Not only to make sure that they were getting effective feedback, but we found that it was vital to the discussions we had around contract renewal or yeah. you know, not renewing a contract. Right. If you don't have some sort of written evidence that, or, or a record that you gave feedback, it, it could be problematic when you then give it at the time of a contract renewal discussion. Yeah, correct. Thank you very much for bringing that up, Jason. Um, the other thing I highly recommend, they're expensive, but they're worth it, are 360s, right? So you're getting feedback from at least eight people. Um, you know, this is a, you pay for this uh, this review. This is not done by congress. It's done in a professional where, in a professional setting where a rabbi is asking or a clergy member is asking eight people around them, right? That might be people who are side by side with them, people who are subordinate in the hierarchy, people who are above them, um, and uh, without names. Uh, and and the, those results are, are given are given to people. Um, anecdotal information around performance is often very pernicious and not helpful. Yeah, please. I'm wondering whether anyone has performance expectations. Oh, nice. Anyone have performance expectations you develop for your clergy? Yeah, Jason. It's in the, it's in the contract. We have a, a part of the contract which lists you know what the expectations are and how our reviews are actually try to align them with that list in the contract. Yeah, I mentioned that most of us undergo performance reviews in our work, and there's no reason that everyone doesn't undergo them, right? Obviously, we want to do them in a gentle and loving way, as we would like to be treated ourselves. Sometimes I've seen two instances in the 360s where people have actually had a total turnaround of their own work, the way they approach their work, because they were given really credible and important feedback. Um, I, I had a guy in New Jersey I was once working with, not, not in a Jewish nonprofit, he just he was made himself very vulnerable in a group of 30. He said, I got a 360 that told me that people don't like to work with me. Um, and he said, and I, I kind of realized that I was I was unnecessarily bossy, 
that I was demanding. I was. I did not make people feel good. I, I couldn't believe that he was saying this. This was a room of strangers. And he said, I said, what'd you do? He said, I actually took this feedback really seriously. I asked a number of people how to handle it. And I just decided that my, my job was on the line. And I, I kind of am not that same person, which I thought was pretty remarkable. Um, so these things do, they, they, they can work in, in an important way. All right, five, finances. Knowing the financials of your board. You don't have to be an accountant and an actuary, but you, you know, basic budgetary issues. This became a huge issue for the Smithsonian. Hello, do you remember? We're board members who are who, who are running big companies themselves, right? Had no idea what the financials were of uh, 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 of the Smithsonian. So th these are not obvious to everybody. Program oversight. Boards have program oversight, which means you're not micromanaging a, a board pro uh, a program, a synagogue or, or a day school program. What you are in charge of is making sure that your programs cohere with the mission of the organization. So if I say, you know what? I'm thinking we're gonna have a hollow bake on the eighth day of Passover. <laughs> I would hope if you had board oversight that you'd say not really keeping in line with our mission, right? Um, so program oversight. Um, let's go to six, fundraising. This could be a give or get. What is your responsibility in terms of fundraising? Um, seven is board effectiveness. That's where Martin spoke about, uh, you know, uh, how many people are on your board, or Jeremy gave us how often you meet. It was how effective are we as a board? What needs to change for us to be more effective as a board? So I want to get to fundraising, back to fundraising. And here's why. Many people think that there's one responsibility for the board, and that's fundraising. And the presidents of many boards run their boards as if this is your only responsibility, and they're constantly disappointed because you're not doing your fundraising, and it didn't used to be this way. It used to be that you wanted people on your boards who represented lots of different things. Some might have legal expertise, some might have marketing expertise, uh, some people are in HR, and, it was your, and some people are really creative, some people are numbers people, some people have institutional memory, and there were all kinds of formulas for how you comprise a great board. Today, there's one thing that people look for in boards. Financial capacity. And it's made lopsided boards. It's made boards that cannot always think clearly about membership, dues, tuition, other things, because for them, these things aren't, aren't uh, critical. Sometimes it's created lopsidedness from a gender perspective or a demographic perspective. Are, are all the places you serve appropriately represented uh, by your board, right? And that's not always the case if it's heavily weighted to the financial side. The other thing is that people have a feeling, if I don't have money, I am not important for I am not important for And it's, I cannot, I cannot stress this enough. So I am actually going to invite all of you thinking about board attendance and thinking about board uh, development to think about, to, to look carefully at your own boards and look at that lopsidedness and do something about it because this is not the way of the future. This is why it's hard to get people on boards. I mean, it's hard to get people to be members. You know because who gets the attention? The people who give the most money, get the most love. And people are drawn to people who love them the most. If you don't love me because I'm not giving you what you, then I, I, I don't feel that I'm important here. And we have perhaps not intentionally communicated that. But that is, that is a is, is really a bottom line for a lot of people who don't join organizations. Yeah. Can I just share, Please. Um, in case there are people in the room who feel nervous about that, I don't know what the makeup of other people's boards are, but I go to Temple Cherry to go to Israel in South Orange. There is zero expectation of fundraising to be a member of our board, and it does not harm us. So if anybody is nervous about doing that on their boards, I am uh, Do you have a to give? No. Nope. They ask that everybody give what they can, even if that's $18. Right. So I'm a big believer that everyone on a board has to, there, there has to be 100% giving on yes, the board. which we do. Because you can't ask anyone for anything unless you're prepared to give. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a threshold, you know, what your threshold is. Uh, sometimes there's a striated threshold, which could be important. But I'm sure Marjorie would be happy to talk to anybody about this afterwards. Um, about the, this fundraising issue. So I want to throw out a different dynamic, and it gets, to, it gets to the point that we were talking about before about how do you bring more people. 
I actually believe that the way of the future, because it's the way of now, because it's the only thing that's really effective, is to have board members, instead of having a fundraising requirement, is to have a growing community requirement. That every board member is in charge of stewarding 10 families in an organization. You want to negotiate and say, I could do eight, someone else says I could do 12, goes on to eight. But what I'm saying is, the stewardship of families is critical to the, the health and retention of people in an organization. You know, I'm watching this happen in day schools, which is a particular um, issue that I'm, I, I'm involved with, and I've served for eight years on my kids' school board. Uh, we, it used to be a time, again, the fixed price menu, you had four kids, you sent them to the school. Now you have four kids that are going to four different schools. People are tapped out. They can't give a, 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 a you know gift to all these places. They can't they can't give their attention and time to all these places in a meaningful way. So sometimes they don't just give it all, and that's different. And you say to yourself, How did you lose so many kids? If you're looking at day schools now. Day school enrollment is doing poorly. Independent school enrollment generally is, is down. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that boards were so focused on money, they weren't focused. They thought that you know who has to worry about. The head of school, the rabbi has to worry about the families. They didn't say this is a responsibility of the poor because one person, one rabbi, one head of school, one principal cannot keep every family. They just can't. They can't do it in a meaningful way. But if I say, you did, you did in charge of 10 families. And what does that mean for her? By the way, Hillel's have done this successfully. Hillel International piloted a program because people don't want to go into Hillel buildings. A lot of people don't want to get go into Hillel buildings, except the most committed. So they said, you're going to be in charge. We're going to give you a stipend, small. Some kids didn't get stipends, to be in charge of 60 people. And in terms of 60, here's what we want you to do. The first 10, we want you to invite them to Shabbat meals. We want you to invite them to programs. We want you to take them out to coffee. And then in, in varying degrees of commitment to, it, to these individual groups, individual people, you, by the time you're at your you know, 50 to 60, you're not actually, you're just sending them emails. They're on your email list. You're not actually really speaking to them. You know, so what we want you to do is not only be responsible for your 10, but to, to, to varying degrees, be responsible for 60. That's a lot. I would say 10. So you say 10. What does that mean? You invite someone for a Shabbat meal. You call them quarterly. How are they doing? You go out for coffee with them. How are you doing? Are we servicing your needs? I've done a lot of work in customer service. I know that's weird for someone in PhD in Jewish studies, but um, but I found that in the leadership development work I was doing with organizations, Jewish organizations were falling down on this all the time. You had one really friendly board member, friendly professional, and the rest direct. Right? They just receptionists who could barely answer the phone properly. Right? People who said, "Oh, I'm sorry, I can't find. I, I I don't know where he, he is." Hang up the phone. It's like, I, I, I can't, we can't function this way. So I went to the Ritz Carlton Training Institute, I went to Disney, I went to Zappos, I interviewed the people who trained at Zappos. Zappos is an amazing thing. If you cannot, they only they hire for, for warmth and friendliness. In fact, when I was going through the Zappos um, tour, uh, they have, uh, they have uh, who, how, how, who keeps the per person on the phone for the longest? The record at the time that I was there was 10, over 10 hours, that did not result in a sale. Right? They're interested in having you, Zappos, who would have thought you'd buy shoes online? And yet people have amazing shoe buying experiences there. There's a culture there. Read Delivering Happiness. I always say this to boards. There are great books, Setting the Table by Danny Meyer. Uh, the New Gold Standard, which is about Ritz Carlton um, standards. There's amazing work that's being done in customer service, and you can buy the book you can buy a book for every member of your board and actually read it and actually have a conversation about how to do customer service differently. And here's the assumption that all these organizations make that do this well. Don't assume that people know what it means to be nice. You need to train people. Here are the Ritz Carlton 12 principles. Right here's Zappos 10 principles. Right? They have principles. Everybody knows them. There's a little credit card. It looks like the size of a credit card. It's a fold out. Of the, of the 12 service principles of the Ritz Carlton. Everybody has it in the pocket. Every day there's a meeting for a few minutes where everyone talks about it. And here's what I learned, the most important thing, although you should read these books, the most important thing that I learned about customer service is that when someone has a problem, so you're making your call to your family, one of your 10 families, say, how's it going, and someone has a problem, you are not a cheerleader. I have heard this 100 million times that when you serve on a board, you're the cheerleader. You are not the cheerleader. 
You are a responder, right? You are a greeter. You are an ambassador. The cheerleader means someone brings me a problem and I have a Pollyannish response. So here's what I learned in customer service. When someone tells you a problem, you say these three words. Is there more? Or tell me more. And I think tell me more is more instructive as opposed to opening up a question. Tell me more. Because sometimes when that person says, you know what, I actually, my family doesn't really feel that welcome. And then you say, tell me more. And they tell you exactly what happened. And maybe it involves someone you have to have a conversation with. Or maybe they say this, actually, you know what, my grandparents were members of the synagogue, the same thing happened to them. They are carrying something, and they're carrying it for a long time. And you could be the address that turns this around. What does Danny Meyer say from setting the table? Amazing customer service, and they do training also. And you can get them to come, it's expensive, but they do the training in your, in your organization. Danny Meyer says, when you have a failed customer experience, that is the time to demonstrate legendary hospitality and make a friend for life. That is not the way most people think about it. Most people think, if I'm, if I'm losing them and they're unhappy, just let them go. It's like, no, you want to keep people? You, you, you tell, give me your story. Give me what's not working, and we're going to turn it around. So he has amazing stories about people who had a bad experience, and they went out of their way in terms of giving them something additionally and contacting them additionally. And I'm just going to give you a crazy customer service example, not necessarily about shifting a bad experience, but the degree of hospitality. So. Someone goes to a Danny Meyer restaurant and he's got a whole bunch of them, you know what they are, 11 and Union Square Cafe and Gramercy Tavern and a lot of those. So he does the food for the MoMA. Someone has a bad experience in an expensive restaurant. They come in and they, uh, they say it's their anniversary. Not a bad experience, sorry. Not a bad experience. They come in they say it's their anniversary. Now, if someone comes in and says it's my anniversary, what are you expecting from the restaurant? For dessert. Sarah was unambiguous. <laughs> When's your anniversary? Yes. Um, free dessert. She wants a free dessert. Go give her a free dessert. Find out when her anniversary is. Okay. Free, free dessert, champagne, something. In other words, and what he says is, Myers makes a really important distinction between service and hospitality. Service is what people expect. Hospitality is what you give them that they did not expect that actually creates that bond, that meaningful bond. So if I say it's my anniversary, if you give me dessert, that is service. It's not really hospitality because I'm expecting. You know, if you don't give me anything, I'm thinking, what do I for think in a restaurant is this? I tell them something and they don't do anything with that information, right? So here, in their thinking, as we're thinking about this, a legendary hospitality, a couple comes and it gives them champagne and it triggers something in the husband says, oh, you know what? I'm just realizing I left a bottle of champagne in the freezer that I planned for this evening. Is you know, and I, I forgot to take it out. Is it going to explode? And the waiter says, "Actually, sir, I think it will explode." And he gets all anxious and he says to his wife, "I have to go home. I have to take it out of the freezer. I'm sorry to cut this dinner short." Now, if you're trained in the Danny Meyer way, what does the waiter say? No, sir, we'll take care of it. He says, "Just give us your address and let the and let the person at the desk know, and we'll take care of it." What did they do? They sent a busboy to, uh, to their New York apartment, went up, took the champagne out, left the card, and another dessert. And that's what they came home to. So someone said, that's crazy. How do you have the resources to do that? He says, we do virtually no advertising. He said, in the life of an active restaurant goer, 12 times a month, eight times you're going to new places, four times you're going to places that you've been to before. He says, we want to be one of those places. He said, so that, we spent less than $50 on this, and here's what it bought us. A person who says, I want to be here for life. You want synagogue members for life? We're not in the old fixed price menu days anymore. So what kind of tapas experience are you having that you're enriching by getting people to stay longer because you're offering legendary hospitality? You're not defending your organization when something goes wrong. You say, tell me more, I'm gonna follow up, I'm gonna get back to you. And if you steward 10 families, you get to know what are their kids' names. You write it down. What do you like to do on, right, on your free days, right? What's meaningful you, for you about synagogue service? What do you like to give to? Was, what do you care passionately about in the world? And you put that down. And you take that family and you grow with that family. That's what a rabbi does. Rabbis grow with families. But a rabbi of a big synagogue or a small synagogue cannot take care of every family. That's where you come in. 
And we haven't really done this successfully with boards because we've told them we've made it super transactional. This is, it's a fundraising relationship. And if you keep with a fundraising relationship, people feel they're not people. Interesting, we want our people, our members, to be stakeholders. But we treat them like consumers and expect stakeholder behavior. Shame on us. Yeah, please. Great how lovely it is to see you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, I, I love all your ideas regarding the board. The you can hate them also. I, 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 I like them. But, but the challenge we have is board member accountability. We can create a contract, we can create requirements, yeah. but the consequences of not participating for meeting your requirement, you're off the board, it, it doesn't... Right, it's hard when you're also trying to get, you're desperate to get people on the board. Right. Now you're going to say that you're off the board. So I have to say, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that board roles aren't that meaningful for people. So they don't necessarily feel that meetings are energetic and important that they're learning, that they're contributing to building the community. So that's why I said board effectiveness and the board role, the whether board role is meaningful, are really they're really intertwined. So if you say to yourself, you know, we have an amazing board, we've done really good work, people are really deeply engaged, but how do you know if your board members are engaged? I have to say I've served on many boards. I could say that the head of those boards knows nothing about me. And I could say that for the most part I knew nothing about other board members. <coughs> Now, what does that say in terms of my commitment? Why should I come back? Because you know, if it's just reporting, it's not, it's not really going to be, it doesn't feel like a community of meaning to me, um, the way that a synagogue feels like a community of meaning when we're doing it right. So boards have to be more of that rather than less of that. And then we talk about something related to that soon. Yeah? So it sounds to me like you're talking about a whole different kind of leadership training that yes. needs to happen. Yes officers and presidents of synagogue boards who understand their role differently. Yes. And I think there are all kinds of wonderful techniques out there to do it. And it is about making uh, board service meaningful. It's about, um, but it's also about the kind of uh, leadership style and how you, how you create a board structure that has this and that something that can remain steady while different types of leaders with different types of styles come in Correct. and go out. Correct. So it's this is a culture shift. What I'm talking about is a it's actually kind of a radical culture shift. But we need radical shifting right now. Right? So it, you know if everything were going fine, we could just say, you know, I came here, I came here for the Danish. Right? As, but we're we're not saying that. We're saying we actually know that we need to make some radical shifts in order for our institutions to be to better service and be relevant and um, and for ourselves to feel this is something meaningful. And for all of you who are here, there's dozens and dozens of you who are not here, right? Because maybe you don't care as much, or maybe because this role hasn't been sufficiently meaningful for you. We're I I, I think we've got a, a big goal here, Leslie. We've got a big goal. And um, and it's okay because we've got a we've got a dream pretty big in, in, in the job that we're we're doing now. All right. So um, I want to look at death by meeting. Um, death by meeting. That's on page two. Death by meeting um, is actually the name of a book by Patrick Lencioni. It's a great book um, because this is just do a little quick exercise with you in thinking about board effectiveness. All right. So this is what Dave Barry says about meetings and funerals. A meeting can be compared to a funeral in the sense that you have a gathering of people who are wearing uncomfortable clothing and would rather be somewhere else. The major differences are that most funerals have a definite purpose, to say nice things about a person, and reach a definite conclusion, this person is put in the ground. Nothing is ever buried in a meeting. An idea may look dead, but it will always reappear at another meeting later on. <laughs> I sense that you would appreciate this, and I was right. Um, so, um, you know, Patrick Lencioni wrote this book, uh, Death by Meaning, which I invite you to look at and think about, uh, speak to, to Jeremy's point about how often you're having meetings and what are you accomplishing at those meetings and what do you want to accomplish at those meetings. So the Ritz Carlton, for example, has a five-minute standing meeting every day. Uh, five-minute standing meeting because people know what's going on, they're kind of in tune with who, what news is there for the day, uh, they tell stories that reflect their mission, you know. Now, 
obviously in synagogue leadership and volunteer leadership, you're not going to do that. Um, but thinking about how effective your meetings are. So what I'd love for you to do is, um, as a table, is that right? Can we do that as a table? Can you answer that? Um, to create five uh, board protocols together that would help make your board meetings run more smoothly. So just, I'm giving you the opportunity. Um, I'm also giving you the opportunity if you need to stand up and stretch a little bit, then you can do that too. Um, but five rules that would help make your board meetings run more smoothly. All right, you're creating the rules. Go to. I need you to write them down. I need you to write them down. We're going to share that. Professionals and lay 
uh, and they actually had given there, I, I put five, some people put three. I think if you get to more than five or six, it gets a little unwieldy, and it's, it feels a little bit bossy. Uh, but once you can put those protocols down, um, so let's say one of them to speak to Paul's is, you know, no phones in the meeting. Uh, so someone reads them. They laminate them and someone reads them before every meeting. Just, just to remind us of things that we care about, right, things that we decide on together. Um, I want to talk about two things. One is this issue of expressing appreciation. One of the reasons that people don't like to serve on boards is they give a lot of time and a lot of work, and we do nothing for them. And when I say nothing, I mean one way I learned that I was going off of a board was that I had on my, when I had a landline, um, someone left a message that said, Erica, thank you so much for your service. We really appreciate these past two years. And I was thinking, really? It, where did that come from? Right? Um, and it made me really hesitant to have additional roles in that organization, although that's not fair of me because maybe it was, the person was just off, that particular person. But I do think that, um, that having some kind of understanding of the way we thank people and some kind of shared protocol. And I'm actually gonna, because um, because Passover is coming up, I just can't resist a little, little think, a little nod to the Seder. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Saul Schimmel, wrote a beautiful piece on Jewish attitudes to gratitude that he took from Dayenu. And if you feel the need to sing it, go. <laughs> uh, he said, Look at what is Dainu. Dainu actually gives us the structure for Jewish gratitude by saying, if you had only done this, if you had only done that, if you'd only done this, it would have been enough. And of course, it's not enough in the sense that there were things, you know, had you given us the Torah, we didn't get to Israel, I think that wouldn't have been enough, right? Um, but, but, but the same attitude is, can you, when you're thinking about someone, you want to thank your parents, you want to thank your children, you want to thank a friend, and you say, had you only done this for me, it would have been enough had you only done that for me, but you did all of those things for me. And in fact, I want to invite you at your Seder to actually use Dayenu, the structure of Dayenu after you sing it, to invite people to turn to someone at the table, maybe the person next to us, and say thank you, using that, like just three stanzas, right, in the same format. It's really very, very powerful. Uh, it can be very powerful in terms of bringing a table together. So I think that this is a great structure to say to someone, um, you know, have someone handwrite notes to committees or boards to say, here's what you brought, and here's the three things that you were really, you know, you brought to this position. Um, so that it's the kind of thank you note that people really want to save and that they don't get rid of. Um, the last thing I want to do is talk a little bit about succession planning. And, it, and, I, and I, I feel that we're not going to do the job uh, justice. We could talk about any of these things for, for much longer. Um, and I want to ask you what you think. Yeah, please. I'm not going to share any protocol, any of the protocols. You're not going to share protocols because you shared them with each other and because I'm just conscious of your time. Uh, and I know you've got a lot of uh, things to do. And we have a commitment to 10 to 11.30. So I want to talk a little bit about this succession planning and the tensions of transition. What are some of the tensions of transition? Yeah? General resistance to change. General resistance to change. So even if you don't like the outgoing, you know, there's still that we don't know, right? The unfamiliar territory. Yeah, Jay? People aren't familiar with the ongoing responsibilities and, and what's been happening that they're going to be taking charge of. Yeah, yeah so knowing the culture, knowing the way things work, knowing details about how things work, don't know. It's, it's a new game each time. Yes? Ah, people who think that they, right. No, I think you can then give them on to members of your family and your will. Uh, someone else? Yeah, please. Our president is reluctant to leave, and he, their time is up. As opposed to Ron, who's just trying to give it away. Yeah. Correct, and the person leaving has all this information and experience and institutional knowledge the person coming doesn't have that. How many of you currently are presidents? Okay. So people will say this. There is nothing, you know, nothing prepares you for presidency. It's true that being a vice president helps, but the 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 absolute leap from vice president to president is enormous, right? It's a big, big uh, difference in terms of being 
you know, ultimately responsible. And then when you leave that position, it's hard because a lot of organizations don't know what to do with people who are their most senior lay leaders. Um, I'm working on a new leadership book, um, and I have a chapter called After Leadership about people who leave and the bad feelings that many of them have because, bless you, because their experience didn't have anywhere to go. So I, I interviewed someone, and, uh, someone shared with me a couple who called themselves PIPs, previously important people. Um, because the minute they left, uh, you know, they, they, the next day, people were not calling them anymore. They just really weren't important. There was a point where they, someone called them multiple times about every decision, and all of a sudden, they get almost no attention. So from the succession planning, I want to suggest, instead of looking at succession planning, I want to look at a trajectory of leadership, and that post the position, there's still leadership roles, and those roles really come in the form of mentoring, and we haven't figured out how to do the mentoring well. It's how to use that experience to help. Now, you, you don't want to mentor the person who's coming in necessarily because that person needs his or her own space, but how do you mentor then younger board members so you get up into that, in, in, through that trajectory? I also don't want to think about succession planning as the way that we normally think about it, the most senior position, uh, lay or professional, because I want to succession plan, I want to take the success out of succession planning. Success in an organization means that there is a fluid pipeline for every position. Now that's something you said, wow, we can't even get it for president, how are we going to do it for everybody else? Ah, mistake, everybody else is easy. Getting the president is really hard, but getting other people to step up and to step into something a little more senior, many people feel deeply honored when you ask them. They feel flattered that you think that they're worthy of, number one, being on a board or being on a committee, and number two, making their way slowly to an executive committee level in terms of their leadership. It's hard to get presidents, that's true. And one of the things that's hard is that we don't always let go of the leader beforehand. So just quickly, I want to mention this story because we're going to welcome Eliyahu into, our, into our every pace out Seder. Um, and uh, it's a story about Eliyahu leaving. When Eliyahu leaves, when Elijah leaves and he's taken off in a whirlwind, he goes with a young novice. I want to talk about this novice. His name is Alicia. Uh, I don't have the text here where Alicia gets his job. I'm just going to tell this to you. Alicia gets a job because Elijah is walking. Eliyahu is walking. He passes a field where this young man is plowing. He takes his cape and he throws it over him. This is a person who's a farmer. He's not a prophet. And in fact, in the text that you have, there are actually people in the graduate school for prophecy in the old days, right? There are schools. This is a, the prophets of these schools of prophets were actually trained to do this. But Eliyahu throws his mantle over someone who is not a likely candidate. He's not old, he's not experienced, he's not in this field. But Elijah and God see something in this young man, Elisha, who then lovingly kisses his family goodbye, divides up his plow, and goes off to learn with his mentor. Now, it's his mentor's last day on earth, and the two of them lovingly travel together. Everybody sees, because it's something very transparent, sees these two traveling together, understands that Elisha is the likely heir for the Elijah legacy. And it's this very sweet scene where Elisha, Elijah says, uh, you know, what can I give you? It's a deathbed scene. What can I give you so that you can leave? He sees the anxiety of this young man. And Elisha says, I need double portion of your wisdom to do your job. Because I need to be twice who I am in order to do what you're doing. So Elijah says, I you know, that's a very, very difficult thing. If any of us know someone who's seen, and you say, I just need to be more like you. You asked a very difficult thing. I can't give you that. He says, but when I leave, if you see me leaving, right, if you can see me, then you will inherit this job. Then you'll, you'll get this double portion. So Elijah floats up. If you know the scene, he's done in a lot of artwork. He floats up. And Elisha says, Abi, Abi, Rechev Israel in Parasha. He says, My father, my father, chariots of Israel and horsemen. It is no verb. And so a lot of commentators are stuck on this. Why is it no verb? But he's doing exactly what his mentor told him to do. He's saying, This is what I see. I see him being taken away. And I just want to unpack that metaphor to see someone being taken away. Your gift of stepping into shoes that are bigger than yours right now 
the capacity to see someone else leaving. Sometimes you can't imagine someone else leaving. So you can't imagine that there's an empty position. He says, if you want double the wisdom, watch the fact, don't be in denial. Understand, I'm going. And he goes. He throws down the mantle. And once again, Alicia picks it up. He tries to separate part orders, like his or like his, 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 his predecessor did. And he, par and, he, and he separates all these people, these candidates for the position, are watching. And they said, well, where's Elijah? Where is he? And she says, don't go look for him. Because they didn't see. They couldn't see into the future. They couldn't see what happened. So they thought he never left. And in fact, we know there's some organizations where we have new presidents, we have new rabbis, we have new heads of school, but we're always looking for what the last leader did. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So it's hard to, it's hard to grow people well. But it's easier than we think. Because grown people doesn't mean the desperate growth of someone who's a vice president to be a president. It's grown people and creating a culture of growth and succession for every position. Because those low-hanging fruits will actually bear fruit in the most senior positions, sometimes way off in the future. We've talked about a lot. I learned a little bit. Uh, we talked a lot about, and you helped me understand the, the wisdom that you've been using, how to make your boards more effective. Think of it not as boards being more, more effective. Think of it ultimately as a Jewish community being more effective. Because that's really where we're going. That our great and deep and old and young Jewish family needs to be a meaningful place for people to give service for people to receive the on the receiving ends of our one, and for all of you to have board positions which help you lead in a masterful way. So I want to just end by thanking you for your service.